But back to the basic idea of what is a black hole. Uh, last time we were talking a lot about an analog of a black hole, horizons in Minkowski space, okay, that happen when we have these accelerated observers. And just so you know, such kinds of horizons are called either acceleration horizons Or sometimes these things are called Rindler horizons, after Wolfgang Rindler, who, well, popularized such things and explained to us how important they were. All right. So where we were last time is that we had observed, more or less just by looking at this picture, that acceleration horizons have all the properties that we've heard about but don't yet, under, quote, understand about black holes. Um, we discovered that... For example, uh, they are, in fact, sort of one-way surfaces of communication. That is, it is impossible for our accelerated observers outside the horizon, or, in fact, any observer who always remains outside the horizon, to determine what happens beyond the horizon because of the speed of light causality barrier. We also found that this sort of framework exhibits what is effectively a, a gravitational redshift. We found that if an observer here... Uh, has one of her friends sort of wander down to the next observer, hang out there for a while, and wander back up, that this white path experiences less time to elapse than does this yellow path. So this is the same thing that happens near a black hole, time slows down, etc. Okay. So we understood these things just pictorially before, and what I want to do to make the connection with the way in which black holes are usually presented, which is in terms of the so-called Schwarzschild metric, is to, uh, well, to try to encode this in some mathematics. Okay. All right. Now, we mentioned last time that, in fact, all of the details of Minkowski space are encoded in this equation here. This equation, by the way, because you have not seen this term, is known as the metric for Minkowski space because it tells you how to measure things. It tells you how to measure times and distances, et cetera. Okay. Our goal here is simply to rewrite this metric in terms of a coordinate system which is better adapted to our accelerating observers. Okay. We realized last time, for example, that accelerated observers measure distance not really with x, but in a different way. We realized last time that if I take two of these uniformly accelerated trajectories, with which asymptote to the same light cone, we realize that those accelerated observers always find themselves to be the same distance apart. Okay? They don't experience the, they don't detect directly the Lorentz contraction that an inertial observer would see for the accelerating rocket. So they measure distance in a different way. And what we mentioned was that each of these lines can be described by an equation, x squared minus t squared equals c squared, and that it's this variable c, this label c, that tells us how far apart two of these world lines are. That is to say, if I consider the observer at c equals 2 and the observer at c equals 1, if you ask these two observers how far apart they are, they'll believe that they are always a constant proper distance of 1, 2 minus 1, apart. Okay. So in that sense, this variable c is a natural measure of distance for the accelerated observers. All right? OK. So now what we have to understand is, what's a natural measure of time? Well, this is one of those things where I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and leave some of the calculations for you to do in uh, the last week as homework. But I'll tell you the answer. You recall last time we found it useful to introduce this hyperbolic angle theta. And we mentioned that you can use it to parameterize these world lines using hyperbolic trigonometry, just as one would do, let's see, x is c hyperbolic cosine of theta, and t is c hyperbolic sine theta. So this is in direct analogy to what we'd find if we were using uh, trigonometry and polar coordinates in the Euclidean plane as opposed to the Minkowski plane. All right. My claim is going to be that this coordinate theta is, in fact, uh, a natural measure of time for these accelerated observers. 
Okay? And I won't go through the calculation of that for you, but let me explain the logic behind it. The logic behind it is this. You're all familiar with Cartesian coordinate systems on Minkowski space. You know, if I have a time direction and a space direction, there's the important property that these two directions are in some sense orthogonal. Right? If you choose a space direction, the time direction is orthogonal to it. Now, I said very carefully in some sense, because we all know what happens under a Lorentz transformation. If I change reference frames, I switch to a different coordinate system, x prime, t prime, which, of course, don't appear to be orthogonal in the usual Euclidean sense, but are really orthogonal in some greater uh, sense of Lorentz spacetime. Okay. So the point is that what you should do to figure out, to understand why theta is a natural time coordinate here, is to understand that theta and xi have the same relationship as x prime and t prime. And you can kind of see that it looks right, because at least, you know, there's the line for constant position. Here's a line of constant theta. And at least, all, all, this line is curved, so that's a little bit new. But at least right where they intersect, this picture looks something like this one here. The two axes are sort of squeezed together. Right. I did not, uh, right, they're, they're, yeah. In fact, if you work this out perfectly, you would find that just as in this case over here, there's sort of the same separation between, uh, there's a kind of local symmetry of flipping this diagram around a light ray. Okay. All right. So it's the same thing here. The actual calculation you'll do to verify this is you will compute d theta and d xi, and you will show that these are orthogonal. in the sense of Minkowski space. Okay. All right. Actually, if, if for those of you who already understand how this kind of process works, you will see that I, in fact, am going to do this calculation for you, but I'm not going to explain why it implies that in case you're not familiar with it. All right. So now our goal is to take this basic expression, where did it go? From Minkowski space, here, okay, and rewrite it in terms of theta and xi. So just a little, little arithmetic, as Tony said this morning. So let's do that. Um, let's see. Uh, what I want to do is somewhere here, shoot. Let me do it here. I have expressed both x and t in terms of xi and theta. You'll notice, however, that what appears in the metric is not x or t by themselves, but dx and dt. So we simply differentiate dx is dx times hyperbolic cosine theta plus x times hyperbolic sine of theta d theta. Similarly, dt is equal to dx times the hyperbolic sine, oops, did I get through? Yeah, okay, that's right, of theta plus x times the hyperbolic cosine of theta d theta. So our next step is just to proceed forward and calculate what is ds squared. Well, it's minus the square of this plus the square of this. Okay. Um, I don't know how much of the algebra to do. Maybe it's worthwhile to do it just so we see it all once. So if I uh, write minus the square of this part, dxc squared cinch squared theta plus 2 dxc xc cinch theta cosh theta, and of course there's a d theta here, plus d theta squared c squared cinch uh, yeah, squared theta. And now there's a term which is similar but has a positive sign for dx squared dxc squared, now it's hyperbolic cosine squared theta, plus 2 dxc d theta. Again, there's a cinch and a cosh. Plus, the last one is, is d theta squared, xc squared 
cost squared theta. All right. So now, to finish off the arithmetic, we can notice that this term here is the same as this term here. But of course, there's an overall minus sign up here, so those cancel. Then this term here is a lot like this term here, except that it has cosh instead of cinch, and it's plus instead of minus. Okay? But luckily, cosh squared minus cinch squared is 1, so this all becomes just d c squared. And then there's this last term. Again, they're very similar, but there's a cosh instead of a cinch and a different sign. So this one becomes minus c squared d theta squared. And here we have what's known as the Minkowski metric in Rindler coordinates. Okay. Now, what I want to do is just pause to see that this has the kind of effects that we were talking about just before. Um, as we discussed yesterday, the point of a metric is that it tells you how to measure things. Okay. It tells you how to measure either proper distance or proper time. So let's again, let me quickly redraw my picture since it's gone off my board. Let us again consider uh, a couple of these world lines, like so. We could ask two questions, one being the distance question. The distance question is, how far apart are these two events, or what is the proper distance between those two events? Here you'll notice that these events are connected by a line theta equals constant. So since theta is a constant, d theta is 0. As a result, the metric tells us that ds squared is dxc squared, or that the distance ds is just dxc. As we said before, c measures the proper distance between the observers. Okay. Conversely, if we ask not about distance but about time, we want to know how do the clocks of these observers tick, so to speak, then we can ask about pairs of events like this. I'll put an orange event there and an orange event here. Now these two orange events are on a curve which have the same C, so it's a curve with C equals constant, so D C equals zero. And therefore, if I compute proper time, proper time squared is minus proper distance squared, which we've seen here is therefore C squared D theta squared minus d c squared, which vanishes in this case. So proper time is just c d theta. In other words, as we said before, if you're at smaller values of c, recall that c equals 0 along these light rays, if you're at smaller values of c, less time passes because this coefficient is smaller. Right. And that's, that's just, in terms of the metric, that is the gravitational redshift. Okay. So the important point is that we go to look at the black hole case, we'll expect a feature much like this near the horizon of a black hole. We'll expect that there's some coordinate which tells us something about time measurements, and that the coefficient of that coordinate becomes small near the black hole's horizon. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right, now before I go on to the black hole case, I wanted to point out something important here, which is that although I've introduced this lovely coordinate system and it allows us to understand a lot of things about how black holes are going to work, this coordinate system only exists in this wedge of Minkowski space. Okay? Because, I mean, look at the equations I used to define it. Uh, they're somewhere up here. 